chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. This episode is brought to you by Fume. Remove the bad from your bed with the Fume flavored air device now featuring the softer finish Solano model. Right now is the best time to start the good habit with Fume. All orders for the month of January have buy one, get one cores, so you can stock up for that New Year's resolution. Plus, as a listener of the show, you get an extra 10% off when you use our code. Head to tryfume.com dark and use my code dark for an additional 10% off plus BOGO cores until January 31st to help make starting the good habit that much easier. Start the good habit at trifume.com slash dark to save 10% off the journey pack today. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs. Thank you for listening, and enjoy the show. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 14, Episode 13. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'll be performing four tales to terrify you, courtesy of authors Kyle Harrison, Dominic Eagle, and Micah Edwards. Tonight, we'll hear stories of entrancing enclaves, terrified towns, cemetery callers, and macabre memories. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail, so lock your doors... Turn your lights down low and settle in. <laughs> the show's about to begin. <laughs> in our last episode together, we talked about horror of the Victorian age. Now, let's talk about horrors that may have been around since the Victorian age. You see, while stories of the bloodthirsty and dead have been around since time immemorial, it wasn't until the late 19th century that we got the vampires as we know it today. Before, they were vicious, nasty, horrific bloodsuckers that would stop at nothing to get what they needed. But now, well, they do the same thing, just usually in a way that's more presentable. But be it Dracula, Lestat, Edward Cullen, or our good old Count Orlock, best thing to do is stake hard and stake them good. 
mind. If they're not a vampire, well, at least you try. We begin tonight with Mr. Kyle Harrison, who's brought to you a lovely little tale of a society in which the vampires aren't hiding anything. In fact, they seem very generous and caring. Unless, of course, they are hiding something. But they wouldn't do a thing like that, would they? Without further ado, I present to you Blood Lottery. I can't say I recall when I came to the compound. It almost feels like a dream that I've been living, even though the circumstances are far from ideal. I remember being sick, hardly being able to stand. My hands were shaky, and I knew I was going to die. Something ethereal rescued me, or at least that's how I remember seeing it at first. Lately, I've been seeing a lot of things differently, though, so it might be the memories are false and my brain needs time to pick up the pieces. I know this is an odd way to start things off, so let me backtrack a bit and explain what the facility is for, why it is that this place can be considered both a blessing and a curse for anyone who finds themselves there. The short answer is because of the owners. They aren't human, you see. They're vampires. The ones you hear about in legends and see in old horror movies. Pale, tall bloodsuckers that embody everything dark and evil that exists in this sad world. It's not like they hide the fact that they're vampires either. Everyone knows it. They're the ones that keep us fed, house us, and provide everything that we need here. And it's for that reason that we're here. In exchange, they offer us the privilege of being placed on the blood lottery. According to our masters, this is an efficient system that maintains balance between our lives and theirs. Clearly, they deserve to be in power because they're the ones that provide us with everything that we need. We were all told the same affirmations day in and day out. The masters should be praised. They gave us life and therefore can take it away. Until a few weeks ago, this sort of thing was in my brain and it was as common as a prayer might be. Mindless chants I fed to myself to keep myself from being too free. Freedom, you see, it comes with a cost and mine isn't one I can even say I managed to obtain for myself. For that, I have my wife Kate to thank. We met here in the compound during an art class. One of the senior staff, a vampire named Chicory, was teaching us how blood could be interpreted as sacred for the source of our designs, and Kate and I wound up being our partners. Back then, we were both under the spell of the vampires. Chicory was seen as a god to us, but even gods can fall short of glory when love starts to grow. I remember passing the blade to my art partner, focusing on her radiant skin. It seemed a shame that this gorgeous woman was about to cut herself to the very bone, all in the name of spectacle. Part of me wanted to watch the blood trickle from her neck and see Chicory go wild with hunger just at the mere sight of the red body fluid. But as she pricked her neck, I told her to stop and asked that she give me the blade instead. A portrait of beauty shouldn't be marred, I said. It was a lame compliment. But all of us had learned to speak this way around the vampires. They were from a different time and insisted chivalry and colonial language were more appropriate than anything we remembered from our life before. If we even remembered our life before. As I let the blade work its magic on my body, my open, bloody chest, now a canvas for chicory to work with, the pain coursing through my body sent ripples down my mind. I didn't understand, at first, the feeling, but as I cut deeper, I recognized the sensation was memories returning to me. When I came to this compound, I was told I couldn't remember the world before. We all were. We thought the world to be dead, you see. Our vampire masters had saved us from a world that we, as humans, couldn't exist in any longer. Except the memories I had weren't of that sort of life at all. When the blade hit my face and I jabbed it deep against my cheek, I saw that I once had a family. 
Life was happy and pleasant. And it was with that strike against my body I first experienced cracks in my faith. When the session ended, I asked for Kate to let me be partners with her the next time that we went our separate ways. I returned to my dorms, trying to chant the same mantras. All of us were told about the old world. The blood lottery, we were told, was a gracious sacrifice. To be taken and fed to one of the old ones was the greatest privilege anyone could ask for. Our bodies are food. It's nature. They honor us by not treating us as prey, as cattle. But when I sat up in my bed and looked at the wounds on my face, the way Chicory treated me bothered me immensely. The affirmations felt like lies. My master had attempted to feed on me in front of the entire art class, unable to control himself as the blood flowed. It didn't matter if I was in pain or if I didn't even survive the event. That surely meant that they weren't telling the truth about the way they treated us. At least that's what I was beginning to feel. It was only a modest inkling of unease, but I couldn't shake it. And I was determined to make sure Kate could feel it, too. Over the next few months, I went out of my way to get closer to her and the coven she was associated with. Here in the facility, there are five. It was supposed to make us feel like we were part of something greater than ourselves. But honestly, as I started to learn more about Kate... I realized that this was merely to keep us on a tight chain and to watch us at all times. Our masters had arranged for us to get to know each other. Some advanced algorithms they used said we would be a perfect match for one another. We were supposed to be thankful. Of course, at the time, I didn't know about this. I was unaware of how much my life was beyond my control. The cracks didn't start to form until they took Kate from me. I suppose it's ironic that their own downfall is the result of the very experiment that they'd created. They thought by controlling my life, they would subdue anything that I had questioned. For a while, I was happy. I even proposed to Kate, all by their design, of course. But what they couldn't have calculated was how much our love would grow. I guess that's something that they forgot because of their immortality. Kate and I had a few years together where life was good, or at least what I thought was my life being good. We'd go about our daily affairs unquestionably loyal to the masters. We'd chant their mantras in our heads and tell each other we were so lucky to be under their care. The world outside's fierce. The world outside's brutal. And here we're safe. And here we have control. But the truth was, it's all just smoke and mirrors. I first saw glimpses of it when a close friend of Kate refused to go to the lottery. We were in the dining hall, a large auditorium where the entire facility ate, and we were watching the massive screen to see whose name would be next for the lottery. Jillian. Kate told me she was a school teacher. When her face came up in the video, all of us began to cheer. But Jillian's face was one of abject terror. I didn't understand that at the time. She was being chosen for a great honor, I thought. The chance to give our lifeblood to the masters was the greatest sacrifice any of us could give. So many of us wanted to be picked. I remember watching her slowly getting up from her seat, trying to remain calm. She kept repeating one phrase. I won't go. Pick someone else. I won't go. Pick someone else. She got louder and louder, and I saw some of the lower vampires begin to take notice. Her eyes weren't friendly anymore. They swooped in and subdued her just as she began to run. The entire auditorium was confused and alarmed by the outburst. Then we heard a chime from above. It was Lysander, one of the old ones. Everyone listened when he talked. He was an original vampire, some claimed. The one that had started the blood lottery. I guess in many respects, he was our God. I still hear that speech ringing in my head. At the time, it sounded like a voice from heaven. It's very disappointing when we encounter ungratefulness on display. This child had a chance to show how much she values her life here, and yet she wanted to squander it instead. 
Would she rather be cast out to the cold, to die and starve in the world above? I think we know who the real victim is here, my friends. This poor, delusional woman thinks she knows better than we do. Take her screams as an example, and remember that the reason we control you is because we love you. We want you to be safe from others who don't value life as we do. Others who will simply devour and destroy. We don't want that. We want order. Balance. That's what we're trying to achieve here, Lysander said. His voice cracked across the room like thunder. The crowd cheered. I remember Kate looking worried. It was the first hint that something was wrong. We'd never questioned the Masters. They were the reason we were alive. But she was disturbed by what had happened to her friend, and so she began to ask questions. I remember being confused and worried for her. As days slipped into weeks, I couldn't tell if she was still herself. She was distant, secretive. The night before I lost her, she asked me if I really was sure the Masters had our best interest in mind. Don't you find it strange, she said, that we can't recall much about our lives before we came here? How's that possible? Do they take our memories from us? I hate that I gave a canned response, but I was frightened by her. You should be thankful they saved us, Kate. The Masters took trauma from us. I would rather not remember any of the people that I knew dying because of the way the world is up there. At least here we're safe. But we can't be sure the world is terrible, can we? I mean, none of us have ever been to the surface. The facility is all we've ever known. They've kept us under their thumb for ages. You act like it's an oppressive system. They fed us, gave us shelter, work. Our lives have meaning now, Kate, I argued. My voice was shaky as I said those words because I didn't want to admit some of what she was saying was making sense. But to my shame, I humiliated her that night and told her I thought she was selfish and foolish. Even if it's not real, this is the only life I know now. This is what I want, I insisted. I tried to propose to her that night to make things right. I've been thinking about it for some time. But she said she needed more time to be sure. The next day, her name came up on the blood lottery. She turned to me in the auditorium and grabbed my arm. Leon, don't let them take me. Don't let this happen, she said frantically. I was at a loss for words. I didn't know what to do. Her eyes filled with panic as two vampires came down the stairs to escort her to the launching facility. They'll kill me, Leon. I'm being silenced. Don't you see that? It's because of what happened last night. They were listening. I stood up, guiding her through the crowd to the edge of the room. Maybe we can reason with them. If you just cooperate and show them that you're sorry, this can all go away, I told her. It was a naive response to a problem I knew was spiraling out of control. She looked ashamed to be near me. We have to fight. Don't you see that? They're going to kill me, and your response is just to play nice? Kate snapped. Kate! They're the ones in control here. What am I supposed to do? I asked defensively as the vampires flanked her on either side. Be the husband you want to be and protect your wife, she said as they tried to grab her, and she kept deflecting them until at last they gripped her arm so hard it looked like it almost turned blue. Sir, return to your seat, one vampire told me. I saw fear in her eyes. She didn't want to die. And at that moment, I realized I didn't want her to either. I tried to reach for her, and the vampire pushed me back so hard that I fell. They dragged her out as Kate kicked and screamed, and I tried to stand up and run after her, but four more young vampires stood in my way. It was pointless to try and push past. I watched helplessly as my love was escorted to the elevator, and behind me, the group cheered as they launched her to the feeding platform and I was unable to do anything to stop it from happening. For the next few days, I was in a spiral of depression and doubt. I didn't know if I was even alive still, to be honest. Without my wife, I was nothing. I wasn't even sure I wanted to be alive. I kept looking at the lottery board, waiting for my name to be called. I wanted them to take me, to bleed the way Kate had. 
felt like the only escape I had left was death. I didn't snap out of it and do something until I learned another ugly truth. I was sitting and smoking with a few friends, trying to drown my sorrows with cigarettes and booze when Frank commented, I don't normally say this, Leon, but it's a shame that Kate got picked for the lottery. I tried to remember how I knew Frank. It was from the clinic, I recalled. We went there almost once a month for a shot to keep us vaccinated from the diseases of the upper world that could still hurt us. Now, what do you mean by that, I asked. He took off his glasses and rubbed them nervously. Well, her condition. It's usually not common for them to do that, he said with a slight smirk. Her condition? I asked softly, the room spinning as he announced casually that Kate had been two months pregnant. I had just told her a few days before her name was called. Usually they don't ask for a woman in the first trimester. I think it was probably a mistake. I stood up and told him to stop talking, the room spinning. Suddenly I needed to puke. That's just what I did next, and I announced I needed to go home. Do you need a drive? Another asked me. I can walk, I told him. As I stumbled home in the dark, my head felt faint and my heart heavy. Pregnant. She'd been pregnant. I was supposed to be the father. But because of my cowardice, I didn't even have the gall to do anything to stop them from taking her. I don't even know how I made it through the streets, but I found a bridge and considered jumping. To die by such a fall would surely be better than waiting for the day my name was picked for this sick game. It was at that moment, as I stared into death, a new purpose was born inside me. I could see Kate's reflection from beyond instructing me, telling me that I needed to seek revenge. I dedicated myself to getting better at my craft. I was already doing portraits for the lower tiers. Helping them to view their supposed beauty made my name spread across the chiefs of the sector. Soon, vampires from across the realm were asking to have their likeness painted. It's a job I took pleasure in, painting them, and making them think that I truly cared about their kind. It was the fastest way to get noticed by the old ones. And that was my ultimate goal. I wanted to stake the old one that had fed on my wife an unborn child. I kept the stake handy, too, right in my coat pocket. They never checked me, never assumed I would be anything besides a mindless drone. I must have played my part so well because it only took a month for Lysander to request my services. His voice didn't ring like a chant in my head anymore, so when I heard him call my name from the auditorium, it sounded like nails on a chalkboard. This ancient beast had worked so hard to control me, to make me suffer by taking my Kate away. And now, at long last, I was going to run him through with a wooden stake. I had to be careful, though. I had to be patient. He took me to the central palace, where most of the old ones stay. It overlooked the entire facility. Here I saw the feeding of our kind firsthand for the first time as a senior chief escorted me to Lysander's lair. Humans were lined up naked and trembling in the cold as vampires prepared to feed on them. They were tattooed like cattle might be, brought from different corners of our massive community. I'm not sure why this surprised me. I had always known there was nothing truly special about the blood lottery. They were tricking us, making us feel simply special, to be placed here and used as fodder for their insatiable hunger. I clenched my fists and focused on the next elevator. I was almost there. Lysander's office was almost at the ground level. I was so high above the entire community that I felt like I was flying. He and his staff were observing everything with constant video feeds, another reminder that we were always being watched. I don't know why I expected to see a wrinkled and crumpled ancient man. This vampire was an immortal. He still looked exactly like the youth he had been centuries ago. It disgusted me to stand there and realize I looked old enough to be his father. So many years squandered pandering to their whims. All because I believe they were protecting us. You're the artist, he asked. 
Yes, my lord. I was told you requested a portrait. A sander smiled thinly. His cold eyes studied me the way a predator might, towards its prey. I have a different assignment for you. Your work has become so well known in our lands. I think your art might also inspire the next generation to see what the world above truly is, he explained. I'm not sure I understand, I admitted. I want you to paint a landscape, you silly child. This tower we're sitting in connects to the ground, the world you once called your own. Many of your kind often wondered what it looks like. They even dared to question if our methods are correct to keep you safe, the sander said. They could see his fingernails suddenly sharpening like claws. They need to see the world for the dark and bleak place that it is, he said, as he took his other free hand and placed it behind my neck. But before you do that, I need to be sure you're fully under my spell. Surrender your blood to me, he commanded. He was so close to me I could feel his breath on my face. Sweat was glistening on my face. I wanted him vulnerable, so I inclined my neck toward him and pretended to offer myself as a feeder. His fangs elongated and his eyes turned white as snow. I knew it was now or never... As his fangs pierced my neck, so too did my stake slam through where his heart should be. I heard the ancient vampire gasp in shock, stumbling backward and looking at where I had jammed the wooden stake into his body. He was about to call for help, and I tackled him to the ground, using his shock to my advantage to finish the job. I had sharpened the stakes to do two jobs. If the heart wasn't successful... I knew another method of disposing of these creatures. I took it out of his chest and slammed it into his own head, lopping it off with one fell swoop. The creature of the night shrieked and cried out, hardly able to do more than gasp for a final breath as his body withered. When I stood over him, though, I felt no sense of accomplishment. My cape was still gone, and I knew my life would soon be over when the guards returned and saw what I had done. I stared out at the facility, wishing I could do something to save any other person out there. Then I focused on the private elevator just past his suite. The one he claimed would take me to the surface. I stepped inside and pressed for the top floor, leaving the remnants of the ancient corpse behind and focusing on what I was to learn. Deep in my gut, I knew what to expect, but the spell wasn't completely broken until the elevator stopped and I stepped out onto a lush green hill. The facility was built on a mountainside, and beyond I could see a veritable paradise. Green grass, blooming trees, winding rivers, blue skies. There was no apocalypse here. No sickness they had saved us from. I'd anticipated this, suspected that every single part of our existence was a lie. But to see it here with my own eyes had brought me to tears. I fell to my knees, not knowing what to do or how to save anyone below. Would they even believe me? Would they still be under the thrall of these immortal monsters? I knew why Lysander and the others controlled so much of our lives now. If I had been part of the hypnotic followers, I too would have seen the world as they wanted me to see. I had Kate to thank for realizing this world was still beautiful. Her death gave me freedom and I knew better than to waste the opportunity to find others who could stop these vampires and change the lives of countless others. I don't know how far I walked. Eventually, there was a highway, and a man took me to a ranger station. When I gave my name and several others I knew, I soon learned that there were missing person files on all of us, thousands in the area. What happened to you out there? the ranger asked, noting my terrible appearance. I had no idea if you would believe, or if anyone will, when they hear of this tale. But I don't ask this simply for others to take my word for it. We must save the others. We must bring these creatures to justice and protect our kind before their influence spreads elsewhere. Only by realizing the world is not what you think it is can we ever hope for it to be better. I learned that the hard way, trapped in a system I never imagined I should question... Don't make my mistakes. Question your reality. 
you'll likely find a very ugly truth buried not too deep beneath the surface. I hope you enjoyed Blood Lottery by Kyle Harrison as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support them by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash Kyle dash Harrison. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash K-Y-L-E dash H-A-R-R-I-S-O-N. Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author. This episode is brought to you by Fume. Some bad habits are difficult to stop, and some will resort to the craziest methods to try and deal with it. Well, for the new year, why not try something that's not quite so crazy? A way to end the bad part of your bad habit while hanging on to the little things that aren't bad. And to that end, I say, why not give Fume a try? Using Fume is as easy as breathing, and by that, I mean, it's literally an air diffuser that lets you breathe delicious flavored air. No sticky aftertaste, no bad chemicals. And it all comes in a neat little device with a nice wooden finish and a little sliding parts, all designed to make ending your bad habit fun and exciting. And now there's even a new model of fume that you might enjoy. The Solano fume has a walnut barrel and an onyx coated mouthpiece. It's a softer finish that might be just the fit that you need to get into the good habits you want. I think it's a wonderful way to start the new year off right and get started on a journey of good habits and good flavor. And right now is the best time to start the good habit with few. All orders for the month of January have buy one, get one cores so you can stock up for that New Year's resolution. Plus, as a listener of the show, you get an extra 10% off when you use our code. Head to tryfume.com slash dark and use my code dark for an additional 10% off plus BOGO cores until January 31st to help make starting the good habit that much easier. Start the good habit at tryfume.com slash dark to save 10% off the journey pack today. Never lie to your cattle. All it does is make them ungrateful. I mean, who do you think they are? Murdering their overlords when they get close to finding the truth? Next thing you know, they're stealing lunches out of the break room. Dominic Eagle brings us our next story, in which a town appears to be concerned about recent events. Well, maybe you would be too, if your quiet little town had suddenly plagued by a series of, well, murders. Let's find out a little bit more about what happens when a small town finds itself having to deal with more than it can chew. Without further ado, I present to you, No Post. Amazon delivery, the man at the door said. Hello? He shouldn't have been there, for there's no postal service in our town. And so I fetched my crossbow before answering the door. We do not receive letters or parcels in this isolated place. Severed from the rest of the world, we've always been content with our solitude. Well, no, that's a lie. It's a quiet town, and it's always been, but we weren't always so afraid. In the face of extreme adversity, humans strive to survive, not live. And that's exactly the position in which my neighbors and I have found ourselves in for the past five years. We've chosen not the lives we want, but only the ones we can have. It all started in 2019 with a terrible winter and an inexplicable homicide. Cause of death, I asked the responding officer. I, er, you better look inside, detective, the police officer replied, motioning to the open doorway. 
I sighed, trudging through the dense blanket of snow, coating the front yard of the property, lit only by the flashing red and blue lights of the parked police cars. A frown spread across my face as I observed the splintered wooden front door. Before I could even step inside the property, I knew it to be a case unlike any I'd solved in the town since moving there ten years prior. There had only been two murders in the time that I'd been detective, and both cases were domestic homicide. But this was something different, and I could feel that in my bones as I crossed the threshold onto the property. Several officers were gathered in the living room, and a scene of ghastliness was illuminated by a stark white crime scene spotlight. The body was that of Lizzie Carter, but there was little left to identify her. If I hadn't already known the lady and her place of residence, I doubt I would have been able to distinguish any of her features. Her face had been reduced to mush, a bloody, brutalized pile of mush, and what remained of her body below the neck was withered and emaciated. Now, I'd spoken to Lizzie Carter only a few days prior in a local grocery store. She was a small, frail lady in her late 80s, but she was by no means unhealthy. For her age, she was in wonderful physical health. And so it stood to reason that her decrepit, shriveled form had to be the result of a horrendous death that she had suffered. But who could do such a thing? Who could do such a thing? And to such a sweet, innocent old lady? That was going to be the most puzzling aspect of the case, I realized. Lizzie Carter had no relatives. She lived alone, and she didn't make enemies. This was no domestic case. Somebody had forced entry into her room and slaughtered her in the most horrendous way imaginable. Exsanguinated, Officer Lucy Harper said, pulling me free from my days. That's what the specialist said. You mean, I started. Drained of blood, she clarified, nodding. Entirely. Every last drop in her body is gone. Other than, well... Harper gestured to the bloody mess across the corpse's outer body and most of the demolished living room. I've never seen anything like this, Lucy, I said. Nobody has, Lucy sighed. She's calling the state guys. Oh, come on, I huffed. He's not going to put this entirely on you, Joe, Lucy said. This ain't some small-town case. Something horrendous happened here, and I don't think it had anything to do with Lizzie in particular, do you? No, I answered. Nothing Lizzie did would have warranted a reaction like this. But I don't want state guys burying their nose in my case, Lucy. I can do this. I want to do this for Lizzie. Lucy sighed. Well, Chief's already encouraged him to drive on down on Wednesday. That'll give us two days. Two days, I scoffed. They're in no hurry, then. We need to act now so this freak doesn't strike again. Again? Lucy asked, startled. I nodded. A killing like this? Out of the blue? It's only the start. I was right, but I had no idea of the terror that was truly unfolding. Before the state police would arrive, I'd understand every last thing, and there'd be nothing I could do about it. I investigated that scene until dawn, scouring every inch of the house for evidence. It was around six in the morning, when Lucy returned to peel me away and that I finally found something of note. Bed, Joe, she sighed. You've been at this all night and you're practically collapsing on your feet. Look at this, Lucy, I said, brandishing something white and glistening. Is, is that a... She began, I nodded, a tooth. It's huge, she said, not human. Nope, doesn't look like any animal fangs I've ever seen either, I said. I can't believe the first team missed it. Where was it, she asked. That's the oddest thing, I said. It was placed atop Lizzie's pillow. Well, it certainly wasn't hers, Lucy said. Nope, I said. She had dentures, but I think we would have noticed ones as large as this. Seems conclusive that it belongs to the killer, Lucy said. Nothing about this feels conclusive. I sighed. A gigantuan tooth neatly placed on a pillow... Leaves us with more questions than we had when we entered. Well, let's get back to the station, Lucy pleaded, heading out of the room. Chief wants to speak to you. I exhaled slowly, 
following my friend and colleague down the stairs. I was mulling over the details of the case, striving to come up with some form of explanation before speaking to the chief, something that would impress him enough to call off the state troopers. I was desperate to prove myself. Joe, Lucy said, stopping in her tracks at the door of the living room. What? Where? What's up? I asked, pushing past her. The answer was inside the room, or rather, it wasn't. Lucy's body was gone. All that remained in the room, which was slowly being drenched in sunlight of the early dawn, were broken furnishings and blood-soaked floorboards. Get in the car, I said. Call it in. Lucy nodded, speaking into her radio, as we hurriedly sprinted to her vehicle. At that point, we were thinking of a killer returning to claim their prize. Our brains couldn't even conceive of the true horror that was burgeoning beneath the surface of our once sleepy town. A town that was about to change forever. What are you talking about? Chief Anderson barked as we stepped into his office ten minutes later. How in the heck does a dead body get up and leave? I think the killer returned to the scene, Chief, I said. And you let him get away? The man spat, growling at me. For crying out loud, Thompson, fix this! Oh well, I said. And you, Harper, get your butt out there with Carlson and Smith. They're chasing their tails out there, and I'm at my wit's end. Anderson cried, voice breaking. We'll solve this, Chief, Lucy promised. You'd better, because I got sneery state pricks breathing down my neck, the Chief said, slamming his fist on the desk. I'm supposed to be watching my blood pressure, and that's just one thing after another today, I swear. Relax, Chief, I said, pushing the extent of his often lax approach towards me. We don't need state detectives. I got this. Harper's got this. We've all got this. Anderson angrily scooped a fang from the table and waved it maniacally before our eyes. You've got it all under control, do you? What the heck is... Sir! A voice interrupted as the door opened. It was Bradshaw, and she looked white as a sheet. And no more bad news, Bradshaw. I swear to... Anderson began. We've got another case, Bradshaw gulped. Another. Anderson started eyes widening. Don't say what you're about to say. Mass homicide at Five Parkerson. No! The chief bellowed, slamming the table. Thompson, Harper. We're going, chief, Lucy said. We followed Bradshaw out of the chief's office and mumbled quick thank yous for him saving us. Save the gratitude, Bradshaw muttered. The guy who called in the incident, he said that some things... Uh, I don't know. Just prepare yourself. Lucy and I nodded, both still fueled by the adrenaline of the night before, and I believed I had seen the full extent of this killer's horrific methods. But I was still innocent to the true meaning of terror. I hadn't even begun to see the levels of depravity to which this terrorizer could stoop. Lucy and I drove to the scene of the crime, joining several other officers, who looked even paler than the night before. What's the situation, Carlson? I asked, stepping onto the front yard of a five Parkinson Road. It's it's worse than Lizzie, Carlson said quietly. So much worse. There was a teenager shivering on the front porch under a blanket, being watched by a couple of officers, and I strolled over to him even before thinking about entering the crime scene. Hi, I'm Detective Thompson, I said, but you can call me Joe. What happened here, kid? Uh, what's your name? I'm Sam. The kid wheezed. It was... We were having a house party last night. And, uh, well... Are you the son of Richard and Grace all I asked, realizing I recognized the house? The boy gulped, nodding. They're... Uh, on the way home. But I don't think they'll want to go inside. I think they'll want to burn it all down. Before I go inside to investigate, I started... Is there anything you might be able to say that could help with the investigation? Sam looked up at me with somber, bloodshot eyes. His skin was so pale, so terribly, terribly pale. And he kept shooting fearful gazes at the sky as if he were unimaginably afraid of something that the officers and I couldn't possibly have hoped to understand. And at that moment in time, he would have been right. They killed everyone but me, he whispered. I sighed, 
believing that we might have found our prime suspect already, given that he lived only one block away from Lizzie Carter's house. A drunken teenager on a killing spree. Pieces of the puzzle were missing, but the edgy, unhinged boy filled my gut with a dreadful feeling. Take him down to the station, Smith, I said to one of the officers. The boy's eyes narrowed into slits, and he hissed like a wild animal. The look he offered was unlike anything a human could cast. It wasn't even something primal. There was nothing animal about the kid. He looked like a corpse. Don't, he growled. Sam, please don't resist, I sighed. Let's not make this unpleasant for your mother and father when they arrive, okay? Unpleasant? Sam asked, curling his lips into a wry smile. You don't know unpleasantness. Step inside, detective. You might change your frame of mind. It did for them. Isn't that right, Officer Smith? Smith offered me a pale expression, gulping and nodding, but still summoning the strength to lean forward and seize the boy's arm. Come on, Smith ordered, to the station. As Sam was dragged to the front stairs of the porch, he hauled the blanket over his head, continuing to hiss and sneer relentlessly. With every passing second, that fragile, broken boy seemed to slip away, being replaced by something sinister. What's that about? Lucy asked, joining me on the porch. I shrugged, watching as Smith and Carlson fought to shove the kid into the back of their vehicle. But once I was certain that he had been safely put inside the car, I beckoned for Lucy to join me inside. A couple of the officers warned me that she began. She didn't finish her sentence. Lucy and I stood horrified in awe as we witnessed the sickening spectacle within the large entryway of the Hull household. Hanging from the branches of the chandeliers were nooses, and within each the limp, lifeless bodies of Sam's university friends. But most horrifying of all, the bottom half of their corpses were missing. They were no more than torsos swinging in a lobby, and the floor beneath was coated in an even thicker, larger pool of blood than that at Lizzie Carter's house. I think, Lucy said, clasping her mouth, no, I'm okay. There'll be time to throw up later, I said quietly. What the heck's happening here, Lucy asked. Do you really think that boy did all of this? Killed Lizzie too? In one night? I, I sighed. I don't know. This is just... I trailed off, walking toward the pool of blood in the middle of the floor. I'd spotted something in the murky waste. Well, several things. White, glistening shapes that were eerily familiar. And when I plunged my hand into the drying liquid, I found three large fangs. One for each of the victims hanging from the chandelier, I thought to myself. Are those more teeth? Lucy asked. I nodded. Yep. Lucy gulped, radioing the chief to fill him in on the events that had transpired. I really wanted to believe that we'd caught the maniac behind the night's events, but something just didn't feel right about the whole thing. The fear in the boy's face that had turned to a haunting look of evil as the pupils of his eyes changed. And as we stepped out onto the hall property, I was certain, if only for a moment, that I'd caught one of the victims have bodies twitching. Couldn't have been, I told myself, as Lizzie and I returned to the car. My eyes never tricked me. Upon Lucy's request, I went home and took a nap. I hadn't slept in about 30 hours, and my usually sharp brain was starting to falter. Thoughts felt hazy and difficult to grasp. But when I woke from my nap around 6 p.m., I felt no different, and I realized the confusion had nothing to do with sleep deprivation. It was this inexplicable case. Lucy? I called my radio. Metting down at the station. Silence from the other end. Great. I muttered, peeling myself from the sofa and grabbing my coat. Never answers when you need her. As I drove through town on that wintry night, I became aware of the place's stillness. Eerily still for that time of year. Christmas, in our quaint little paradise, was often a time of month-long celebration. I'd never seen a December night so quiet. Where was everybody? Chief, I spoke into my radio again. Any developments? 
Silence. I realized that my radio had been silent for the duration of the car journey. Earlier in the day, it had been buzzing every other minute, and suddenly there was nothing. Not only that, but no answer. I come from a sleepy town, but we're not that lax. My gut was churning fiercely as I pulled into the police station car park. I reached into my pocket for my gun, sensing that something was terribly wrong. But that trusty revolver would be no use. I stepped foot into a silent police station. Hello, I called. Anybody? I heard a distant door slamming and something clattering. Who's there? I asked, raising my firearm. I'll shoot. But you're all alone, detective. A voice hissed. It came from behind me, and I turned to see in the doorway a tall man, an abnormally tall man. His skin was white and papery, his eyes bloodshot beyond explanation, and behind him the boy, Sam. Without warning, I unloaded the entire clip straight into the man's body, and inexplicably, every bullet passed through his supernatural ethereal form, vanishing into the night air. He smiled. What is this? I asked before calling out. Back up? Anyone? A weight fell on my back and suddenly brought me falling backwards through the feeble wooden desk in the reception area. And I rolled over on the floor to find myself facing a ghost, Lucy Carter. The old woman whose body had 24 hours previous been demolished beyond recognition. And yet, she was very much alive to my eyes, pinning me down and hissing above me with large, menacing fangs. Lazy, I cried. It's me. Joe, she growled. Stop fighting. Just let me feed. I yelled, pushing the woman upwards, but finding beyond all explanation that she was unnaturally strong, and those menacing, terrible teeth were closing on my neck. No, I screamed, shoving her to the side, and through some incredible twist of luck or fate, the corpse of my once friend screamed in agony as it fell onto a large, upturned plank of wood, a sizable fragment of the broken desk. It pierced her torso through the metal, tearing through her heart. I watched as the demonic entity screeched, the deceased form disintegrating before my very eyes, finally being laid to rest, and I came to a realization that seemed ludicrous, nonsensical. I could scarcely put it to words. Vampires. I pulled myself to my feet, throwing my revolver to the side, and scooped up another large plank of wood. The tall man and Sam were gone, but I could hear commotion deeper in the police station, the voice of a familiar woman, Lucy. I clambered over the wreckage of the reception desk and burst through the door of the main hallway, scurrying down the darkened corridor. The silence of the police station was slowly replaced with a growing chorus of screams, crunches, and gunshots. And as I entered the main operating area, I found myself faced with a diabolical scene of destruction. The teenagers from the prior night's mass massacre were full-bodied and happily feasting on several of the officers, and Lucy was holed up in the office of Chief Anderson and Carlson. Her eyes widened as she saw me, and in a fit of adrenaline-fueled madness, I lunged at the distracted teenagers. I plunged my makeshift stake through the back of the first, piercing his heart and turning him to dust. The two others met the same fate, seemingly caught off guard to do anything to fight my advances, though the last girl certainly tried, rushing directly into my awaiting stake. Seeing what I'd done, Lucy and the other officers dropped their weapons, fashioning their own wooden tools of destruction, and proceeding to fight the onslaught of vicious creatures. And then the tall man saw me, eyes squinting viciously, much as Sam's eyes had done earlier. You, he hissed, you obey. The gangly creature paced across the floor towards me, lifting long, fearsome fingers into the air and swiftly knocking the wood plank out of my hands before proceeding to hoist me to my feet. I will drain you not only of your blood, but your morality, the man whispered, and you will suffer a fate crueler than death. You will. 
The man wheezed, pausing mid-sentence and looking down to find a wooden object piercing its heart. A lanky javelin constructed by the chief had apprehended the vile creature from behind. The tall man shrieked, dropping me to the ground and stumbling backward. His followers cried, fleeing from the police station, as their fearless leader broke into a thousand pieces. And that long night finally ended. But the tall man's minions did not perish alongside of them. They terrorize us to this day. We're prepared now, of course, and yet, though they seem to fear us, they do not flee. They simply bide their time, looking for an invitation into our homes under the guise of, for example, a postman. And that brings me to the events of this evening. The Amazon delivery man, standing on my porch with a parcel I didn't order. I glanced through the peephole, his eyes were bloodshot and thirsty. I smiled, opening my front door. And before the creature could reckon with its fate, I released the wooden bolt on my crossbow directly into its chest, sighing heavily as the shrieking creature evaporated before my eyes. And that's why we don't answer the door to postal workers in my town anymore. But make no mistake, this is still very much our town. I hope you enjoyed No Post by Dominic Eagle, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, well, you can help support him by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash Dominic dash Eagle. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash D-O-M-I-N-I-C dash E-A-G-L-E. Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me on this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and it would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other podcast episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link at the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as five bucks a month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Gyrie channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back 10 years to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Gyre. Until next week, stay spooky, and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, 
and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name, and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? (laughs) Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.